This is a slightly older article. This came from October 2020. Here is why the Chrysler 300 SRT was discontinued. So it says the Chrysler 300, along with its Dodge branded platform siblings and the Sprinter van, was one of a handful of good things that resulted from the Daimler Chrysler partnerships of the 2000s. It was a full size American luxury car with a rear wheel drive layout and multiple V8 engine options. Although it owes a lot of its chassis underpinnings to Chrysler's German caretakers at the time, the 300 Charger and Challenger platform, which, by the way, we should not forget the Magnum was the fourth car on this platform at that time. We had the Chrysler 300, the Charger, the Challenger, and the Dodge Magnum, which is still in use today, was based on architecture from the late 90s Mercedes E-Class. But no matter, here was a rear-wheel drive luxury car with optional V8 engines that the average person could reasonably afford. Brilliant, right? Of co- Well, first of all, before I go on, well, I already made one video saying my piece about my experience as a Chrysler 300 owner. But my issue ultimately is the company absolutely fucked themselves. Now, bottom line is this. The bailout era back in 2008 was when they canceled the Magnum. What's amazing about when they canceled the Magnum is that during that same time, that era was when people started to really move from cars towards SUVs. Now, I have some theories about this. I really believe what ultimately happened was that you had people and families who could no longer afford to have two or more cars. I believe what ultimately happened was couples, families, what they decided was in order for them to be economical and efficient, what they had to do was they had to end up getting one car. That one car was more than likely going to be a crossover. Now, that also includes the fact that you've also had a rise of single women. You've had a rise of single men because, you know, there's been fewer marriages as time has gone on since that point, the bailout era. And I believe that, especially when it comes to the women, they have mostly moved towards crossovers. Men, many of them have tried to stay in cars, but a lot of them, because the cars were either too small or too slow or too effeminate looking, a lot of men ended up moving towards trucks. So they moved towards like F-150s, Chevy Tahoe, Blazers, and this, well, not really the Blazer, the Blazer was canceled, but Tahoes, Expeditions, Explorers, so forth and so on. Now, the Dodge Magnum didn't have three rows, but during that time, the Dodge Magnum had such a large cargo volume due to the layout of the car that had they kept that Magnum around, that Dodge Magnum would have been the same capacity as some of these crossovers, but not been so high off the ground that you lose the driving characteristics of having a car. Some people don't want to drive a crossover. Some people don't want to drive an SUV. They want to be lower to the ground. They want to have driving dynamics associated with a car. Bottom line is this. Chrysler picked the absolute worst time they could pick to cancel the Dodge Magnum. They didn't give it the new Pentastar V6 engine. Because let's understand something. Before the Pentastar V6 came out, the engine options were the 2.7 liter 300, Chrysler 300 had the 2.7 liter. The 2.7 liter, most people said, was an oil burner. Now, I had that engine. Um, I had minor issues with that engine, but nothing major. But the 2.7, most people said, was an oil burner. Now, that, that engine was also shared with the Intrepid, the Dodge Intrepid, and the Chrysler 300M. And a lot of people didn't like that engine. I I will say this. It was a very fuel-efficient, regular, unleaded-using, naturally-aspirated engine. The Magnum had that engine as an option. And then they also had the 3.5-liter V6 that was used in the Tourings. And because you got to remember, the Magnum was basically a chopped-down 
300. It had Dodge stuff put on it, and then it had that uh, back space with the hatch. So it was really, uh, it was kind of like, not really a stretch 300, but it shared most of the body work of the 300. It shared a lot of the, the uh, paneling, the sides. It was just that it had a Dodge front end, and it had that special back end for the most part. In Canada, they even sold Chrysler 300s that looked just like Magnums. And in Europe, they were selling those too. Uh, there's pictures of that. Like, you can you can look at them. Um, but uh, three, they were basically like Chrysler 300 station wagons for the most part. So the bottom line is, they had four fucking cars. They had four perfect cars. The Magnum, the 300, the Challenger, the Charger. So how? let's see. You know what? I'm pretty sure somebody at Chrysler was, he walked into the room. He was like, hmm, we've got four cars. We're moving into the future. We're going to introduce the Pinnastar V6. We're going to introduce the new Uconnect uh, radio, the GPS radio. We're going to have a 6.4 liter V8 instead of uh, the 6.1. So we're going to replace the 6.1 with a V8 that can now have cylinder deactivation. And we're also going to continue the 5.7 Hemi, only we're going to give it a boost in power. And then later on down the road, we'll supercharge these engines since they're capable of doing it. So let me just think about this. How, with this perfect lineup of cars, we got four cars, how can I fuck things up? How can I do that? I've got a great idea. I have a perfect idea how I can fuck things up. I'm going to get rid of the Magnum for no good reason. I'm just going to get rid of it. So what I believe happened was Dodge, after getting rid of the Magnum, I believe, based on what I've seen with sales numbers over the years, I believe Dodge Journey sales started to improve. The Dodge Journey sales started to rise. Because let's understand something. What Chrysler did was they eventually released the, uh, what was it, the uh, 200, which I think was too small. Even though the 200 was a pretty, it was an interesting car simply because it was um, high tech, because it had all the tech stuff that you could get out of the 300C. Um, it had the navigation system, Uconnect 8 Touch. It had the uh, Pentastar V6, and it was actually a pretty fast car for its size because you had that same 300 horsepower, but it didn't have the extra weight of the Magnum Charger Challenger or 300. So let's fuck things up. We'll get rid of the Magnum. Anybody who doesn't like it can just go buy a Dodge Journey, and then later on we'll get rid of the Journey too. You stupid motherfuckers. So what they did... They got rid of the SRT badging off of the Chrysler 300 after the 2014 model year. So then what they did was they took the Chrysler 300 to sell in Dubai and Australia. So they have right-hand drive in Australia, but they have left-hand drive in Dubai, just like we have here. And they introduced the 6.4-liter V8, 8-speed they took away SRT after 2014 because I had the uh, 2012. And then they said, you know what? We're going to cancel this shit altogether. Ha, 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 motherfuckers. You guys got screwed. Oh, but what about the Hellcat engine? We wanted a Hellcat engine. Uh, nah, we're not going to give you that because you're fucking stupid. So we're not going to give it to you. Ha, 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 ha. So we canceled the Magnum. The 200 was too small, so we ended up canceling that. Oh, what about the Dodge uh, Dart SRT? You going to give us the SRT Dart? No, you stupid motherfuckers. We're not giving you no Dodge SRT Dart. What are you, dumb? We're not giving you a, a cool small car that goes fast. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. So the Dodge Dart SRT was canceled. The 200 was canceled because it was too small. The Magnum is gone. Never got the upgrades, never got anything like what you see in the 2011-2012 Chryslers. Never got the Pentastar V6, never got the 8-speed, the 8 Connect. never got the 8-speed transmission. Because what's funny is, when you couple the 3-point, the, well, when you couple the new Pentastar V6 engine, the 3.6-liter Pentastar, when you couple that with the 8-speed, you actually get a pretty fast car. That won't, it's not going to do crazy illegal speeds, but it's actually a pretty fast and capable car with that eight-speed engine. So what did they do? They started putting nine speeds that 
sucked. The transmissions had problems. They had electrical issues. On top of the electrical issues, they had problems with the gears in these nine-speed transmissions. So they said, yeah, well, we'll just put that out and fuck them. Whatever. Whatever. Oh, you know what? I have another idea how I can fuck things up a little more. What I'll do is I'll make a track hawk that looks just like the regular fucking Jeeps. We'll put that out. We'll sell it for $100,000. We're not going to give it anything special. And we'll see if these stupid motherfuckers will buy it. And then we'll, and then we'll let the dealers mark them up too. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. Woo. These are great ideas. These are great ideas. Let's see how we can fuck things up. Huh? So the reason why I believe that is because also a lot of people forget because while they were busy butt sniffing and sniffing each other's farts and smelling each other's asses, a lot of people would forget about the fact that Sergio Marconi, when Chrysler was purchased, and when all of these brand marquees were purchased and it became FCEA, FCA at the time, Fiat Chrysler. One thing people forget is Sergio Marconi started pushing all of that fucking European shit in here to America. First of all, Americans, yeah, there are a couple of Americans who can deal with a small car. The average American is fucking huge. Even if you took just my height, I'm six foot six. Do you think I'm sitting in a motherfucking Ford five, a Fiat 500? I said Ford 500. Do you think I'm sitting in a Fiat 500? No. Do you think I'm sitting in a, uh, what is that thing called? An Alfa Romeo Julia? No. Americans didn't want that shit. And that's why they basically have to give those cars away. They, when those cars first came in and they're all the rave and everybody wants to drive one. Yeah, for a little while they sell, and they sell uh, at decent prices. They don't really sell too far above sticker unless they're uh, the, uh, the um, what was it called? The Alfa Romeo, uh, the sports car. Yeah, those sell okay because, you know, some people really want a, a flashy sports car or a Lotus or something. Those, th those kind of cars, those sell okay because there's some people want flashy sports car. But with those Fiat 500s, the Abarths, people didn't want that fucking stupid shit. Very, a couple of people bought those cars because they had manuals in them. For the most part, nobody wanted that shit. Americans don't want that. As I said, a lot of families had to make a choice. They had to say, you know what, We're gonna, we can only have one car. Well, guess what? You know how to drive manual, I don't. So guess what, honey? We'll just get a car that has an automatic and we'll split the difference because we can only have one car. Because if you remember, we had financial issues. We had credit issues, just kind of just like what's going on now, except this time around, it's a supply shortage on top of the financial issues, on top of the credit issues. I'm, I'm diverting on purpose because I don't mind if you're if you're still with me. Congratulations. But the bottom line is people had to make a choice and they had to get one car that served the whole family. That's what put most people in crossovers. So ultimately, how did I get there from talking about the Chrysler 300? My point is Chrysler, especially since I'll say about 2008, has had a long history of disappointments. I have no idea whose idea it was to cancel the 300 SRT in America, even if they kept making it with the 392 engine and they discontinued the badging, we could always slap SRT badges on that car. We could get those off of eBay. You can get anything off eBay. You can get demon badges off eBay. Bottom line is they only took it to Dubai and they never gave us an eight speed. So anybody who bought a, cross, a Chrysler 300 here uh, for the 2014 model year, you were pretty much screwed because you still had a five-speed transmission, just like I did. The 2012 to 2014 only had the five-speed. So instead of letting that car be what it should have been, instead of giving it the upgrades, instead of letting it have the eight-speed transmission, what they did was they pushed everything into Dodge. So first of all, let me just say this. I never wanted to Dodge Charger Hellcat. I only bought it based on the hype, and I preferred the Chrysler 300 SRT. The Chrysler 300 SRT, despite those cheap-ass carbon fiber applique stickers in that car, 
despite the fact that at one point the piston that is in the seats that holds the seat up because it's a powered seat, despite the fact that at one point the piston in my passenger seat failed and I had to take the car in because the piston failed for whatever reason, despite the fact that that car had uh, some minor issues with uh, the electronic systems, very minor issues, dealer was e easily able to make up those things. They were easily able to replace those parts. That was still the better car. That car had every feature you could have in that car. In fact, that car had more features than my Jeep SRT. That car had a panoramic roof. That car had heated and cooled seats, heated and cooled cup holders, adaptive cruise control. Meanwhile, uh, by the way, it also had front and rear bumper sensing. If you buy a Dodge Charger Hellcat, Dodge Challenger Hellcat, you don't get front bumper sensing. I have seen very few Challengers that come fully equipped that actually have adaptive cruise control and front bumper since I've, I've seen at least one, and I got it on videotape, and I uh, it was at a car show in Belmore. Um, there was a guy who had one. I think he had a red Challenger, and he his son also had a Hellcat. They both had Hellcats. These were not 392s. These were Hellcats. And the reason why I was so amazed, because I had never seen the Hellcat with the front adaptive cruise control and... The adaptive, um, the the front bumper sensors, because the, the 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 company was acting as if, oh well, you know, we didn't put that in the car because, you know, you might take your bumper off at the track, and I was like, nobody in their fucking right mind takes their bumper off at the track. That's a bullshit excuse. These cars should have front bumper sensors, and they should all have adaptive cruise control. Period. Well, Dodge Chargers and Challengers, you don't get that. The Dodge Charger and Challenger could have had heated and cooled cup holders. You don't get that either. My bottom line is the Charger and the Challenger are cheaper products. And on top of that, they just don't give you enough to really make you proud to have that car. The Chrysler 300 actually had enough stuff where you could say, man, this thing feels better than having an E-Class. And for the performance that you get, for the price that you get it, because that car was $58,000 for me. I had the black one, as you know. For the price you pay, a Mercedes E-Class would have been way more. Uh, AMG E-Class would have been a hundred something thousand dollars. I got this car for $58,000. The fastest I ever had this car was I was on the uh, New Jersey Turnpike. I was driving 170 miles an hour. I was trying to get higher, but uh, the wind after a while, it's like you start slowing down. I was doing 170 miles per hour. I, I, would, I, would, I should have been worried, obviously, for New Jersey State Troopers. I was doing 170 fucking miles an hour. There's certain parts of New Jersey Turnpike, and there's also certain parts of the I-80 when I would drive down to Pennsylvania where there's nothing but straight road. I know some of you live in states where you have straight road, and you can see four, five, six, seven miles, like just straight, nothing but straight road. Let me tell you something. I was using my gas tank up on those roads. Now, that car wouldn't do 200 miles an hour like the Hellcats do. But let me tell you, I was doing, in the left lane, I was passing people who were doing like 100 miles an hour, and I was flying by them. 155, no problem. 160, no problem. 170 miles an hour, yeah, it starts getting a little skittish. It starts getting a little slow. The, the, the steering was on point. That car had a dual-mode suspension, and it lets you know it had a dual-mode suspension at the time. All you had to do was push a button for sport. car had a dual-mode suspension. That car had everything. The one thing it didn't have when my Jeep SRT beat it out is the all-wheel drive system. Had this car had all-wheel drive, I probably never would have traded it with the exception of the fact that I told you that it got into an accident. But had that car had all-wheel drive, that would have been perfect. Now, we weren't really expecting it to have all-wheel drive because that car got its name and it got its driving reviews. All the reviews on that car were pretty much positive. And that's because it was a rear-wheel drive car with a lot of power and it had a pretty good interior for that price. So now, what we were waiting for was this announcement that Chrysler was making 
So, I, okay, let me hurry up. I'm going to finish reading this article, right? I'm going to finish reading this article because I've diverted for at least 30 minutes. So here we go. It says, in theory, it was brilliant, but in practice, the 300 was a little lacking compared to some of its foreign and domestic rivals. Its styling looked deliberately old-fashioned. I wouldn't say it was deliberately old-fashioned. I would say it, it did have a slight retro-ish look, especially in the 2006 model. But I will say that the 2011 redesigns, those looked, in some cases, as good as the Audis did. And, and it looked understated, but it looked classy. It really did look like a classy car. I really loved the way that car looked. I got a lot of compliments on that car. Sometimes I would pull up to stores and I would park in front of the store and I'd get out and people thought I owned it. I swear to God, there were people asking me for jobs. They thought I owned the store. There were some people, because I wear a black suit all the time when I had that car because it was a black car. There were people who thought I was a fucking drug dealer. Like... The sad thing is, when you live here in New York, people think that when you've got enough money to have something that nice and you can, you can wear a suit or something, they assume that you fucking deal drugs. It's a shame. And then even, what was it, Breaking Bad. What did Walter White go out and buy? He bought a Chrysler 300 for himself. Why? Because the mentality, he's an older gentleman and he wanted to look flashy and classy. He got himself a Chrysler 300. He didn't get himself a Dodge Charger or Challenger. He bought jet. He bought uh, his uh, son the uh, Challenger. He got the Challenger SRT, and it was funny because I owned that car for like years without having seen Breaking Bad, and then found out about Breaking Bad featuring that car years later. Anyway. Uh, this era of Chrysler was one of the worst for interior material quality. I can attest to that. It's true. In automotive history. And let me just say this. The seats were good. The leather on those seats was good. Those seats were thick in the 2006 and the 2012 redesign of the SRT. The seats were great. The problem was like everything else. The... They, they put this carbon fiber applique, they call it. And when I, you know, when I finally get my fucking Jeep back, because my Jeep is still in the shop, they called me today, they told me the PCM, which was supposed to either be there today or yesterday, is not going to get there until the 15th or the 16th. So they're really fucking me over real bad. And I, I don't understand what this is going on. But the bottom line is that's a different story, so I'm not going to get into that. These appliques... These carbon fiber appliques, these things are fucking stickers. But here's the problem. They're made of carbon fiber with a 3M adhesive. If those are on your car, whether you have a Chrysler 300 or you have a Jeep SRT, if you have those things and they start peeling off, if your warranty doesn't cover them, the only thing that you can really do is A, spend a lot of money to try to buy them off the internet, or B, Go to Home Depot, get some epoxy, Gorilla Glue epoxy, and if you mix it right and you paste that stuff on there and you and you clamp it down, you should be able to hold those appliques on there. But guess what? Chrysler, past a certain point, they'll only replace them like once. After that, they stop replacing them. Maybe you can get two replacements out of them, but those appliques are expensive stickers, carbon fiber expensive stickers. So, when I had that Chrysler 300, I never really talked about this in video, and I guess part of it is ego, because the last thing you want to do is you want to tell everybody, oh yeah, these stickers on the fucking inside of this $58,000 car kept coming off. Because naturally, you'll have somebody who, who's got some better car, or what they think is better. Oh yeah, that Chrysler reliability ain't shit, ha ha ha. Well, guess what? Now that I'm at the end of my rope with Chrysler, Jeep, and Dodge, now I'm willing to tell all. Now, now I'm a whistleblower. Now I'm willing to just say it. The interior of that car, for the most part, things were okay. But those applique stickers were shameful. For a car like that, a $58,000 car, to have fucking stickers, that shit was shameful. And, and when I get my Jeep, I'm going to talk about those appliques. But they're carbon fiber trim 
and they're basically nothing but stickers. And when it gets too hot or when it gets too cold, those stickers peel right off. And they'll start to peel up all by themselves. It does, you don't have to have anybody in the car on that side touching them. They will literally, the adhesive will start. And then my question is, well, what the fuck did you put on the back of these things? Whatever that stick-on adhesive was, that shit was garbage. Now, as far as I can remember, that was the only thing inside that car I had a problem with. That was really the only thing. Let me continue. But this is Chrysler, and no vehicle can survive a life cycle without an extravagant performance version. The year is 2005, into the 300 SRT8. A 425 horsepower leather line muscle barge aimed squarely at Cadillac STV, the STSV, and the CTSV. Now, I had a 300 2006 with the 6.1 Hemi. The 6.1 Hemi did 425 horsepower, powerful car. Sounded the part, very powerful sound, very nice muscle, powerful sound. Um, from what I remember, the only things I had problems with in that car was in the seats, there was an airbag sensor. And if the sensor, for whatever reason, was if there was any failure in the sensor, the airbag light would come on. And did I have uh, in that in that car? I don't remember having to replace anything else in that car. Now, some of the materials were definitely cheap, but I did love the seats. They were heated seats, but they didn't have cooling. When my friend got his 2006 Hemi C, because he had the regular 5.7, he had an all-wheel drive. Back then, I actually looked at the Chrysler 300. I thought it was a poor man's Bentley, just like everybody else. I thought it was a poor man's Bentley. We worked at the bank together. We were selling mortgages. I've told you a couple of mortgage stories. And at a certain point, my friend would drink and drive. Yeah, and I, I, know, I know what you're thinking. So what I would do is I'd be like, no, nah, let me drive. You're fucking drinking. It's like, I don't want you driving this car and getting us in an accident or some shit. And you couldn't tell them not to do it because everybody thinks they can handle their high until they fucking crash into something. So anyway, he every now and then he would drink like he'd have like Long Island iced teas and shit. So I would drive his car. When he had that car, the first time I drove that car, first of all, I was taken aback by how comfortable the seating position was because one of the things that helped sell that car was it had such a large driver space. The seat tracks went far back, further back than most Japanese cars allow you to go. Like, if you get in these fucking Hondas, if I get into a Honda, my knees are right in the dash. With the Chrysler products, the, the seats go further back, and you have more space. I also like the fact that the car had features that you normally didn't see in most of those cars at that time. Because you got to remember, this was 2006. He had... The navigation system, something that hadn't really caught on a lot. And granted, it was a it was a crude navigation system, but it did work. And it had a navigation DVD, and it was really cool. It had heated seats, the navigation system, moonroof, all-wheel drive. So he was able to drive that car even when it was snowing, never had to worry about spin-outs or anything. And the all-wheel drive system made that car feel fast because it picked up right away. Why Chrysler never allowed there to be an all-wheel drive SRT model, it's a shame that they didn't because had they made that car with all-wheel drive, that would have really taken off because then people who wouldn't buy that car, who needed all-wheel drive, they would have bought that car. So a lot of them would. Even if they had saved it for the Magnum, that Magnum, that could have helped keep that Magnum relevant. Like the Magnum could have been the version of the 300 that had all-wheel drive. And it had all those engine options. They just didn't do it. They wanted to keep the car rear-wheel drive. On one hand, I kind of understand that they wanted to keep it rear-wheel drive. On the other hand, I really think they should have offered an all-wheel drive version of it. And they could have done it, but they just didn't do it. So anyway, it says, and Pontiac's Australian stepchild, the GTO. It performed well against rivals, but it quickly flated into obscurity as Chrysler began the long process of shifting Dodge to its performance brand. That's where everything went wrong. What they did was they slowly pulled back 
SRT because they were originally spinning SRT off to be its own brand. And that was a brilliant idea. I'm not sure who was responsible for that idea. It may have even been Ralph Giles who helped design the 300. That was a brilliant idea to make SRT its own brand. Now, if you think about some of these other car companies, Hyundai. Hyundai knew that people were never going to take Genesis seriously if they were selling Genesis right next to their other Hyundai cars. Hyundai, from the very beginning, Hyundai said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have concierge service. We're going to make this Equus. We're going to make it so you have a full concierge service. We're going to make it so that if you're at work, we'll come pick your car up and take it in for service. We'll even leave you another car while we take your car into service. So what did Hyundai eventually do? Hyundai stopped selling the Genesis as a Hyundai. They spun it off. They said, no, we're going to call it a Genesis because they were trying to basically recreate what Lexus did. And to make SRT products their own vehicles, that, especially when the Hellcats, especially when, you know, what they call the stupid Trackhawk, no, it should have been called the Jeep Hellcat. When that came out, when those cars, if all of those cars had come out and they had these SRT branded buildings, special Chrysler dealerships that only focused on SRT cars, let me tell you something. That would have been perfect. What did Chrysler do? No, nah, Chrysler was like, no, nah, you know what we'll do? We'll just keep servicing these SR these these hundred thousand dollar trackhawks, these eighty to ninety to even a hundred thousand dollar SRT products, these hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand dollar demons. No, what we'll do is we'll keep servicing those right alongside these Pacifica minivans, right alongside these Dodge Journeys. They fucked up. Let's just keep it simple. They fucked up. They started taking SRT off of these cars. Let me, let me explain something to you. The only thing these cars had going for them was that they were big, huge, and fucking fast. Chrysler took the fucking fast part, started fucking with it, left the 300 with just the 5.7. And the 5.7 is a pretty good engine. That's a pretty good engine, especially if you have all-wheel drive. It's a very good engine. The problem is it doesn't shine like the SRT product does. It just doesn't shine that much. The SRT product looks like a purpose-built race car. It, it's like, yeah, you see this thing? When I'm in traffic and I'm looking over at one of these things and they got these big-ass 20-inch shiny-ass wheels and they got these big-ass, big-ass red brake calipers or orange brake calipers or whatever... And it's got this loud ass sound and it's drone. It's like you look at that and you like, wait a minute, that thing's fucking fast. I got this piece of shit Maxim. I'm not racing him. I got this little ass Honda Accord. I'm not racing him. I got this little ass shitty ass, uh, this Ultima. No, I've got big Ultima energy. I'm going to try to race him. Oh shit, look at that. I lost. That's the reason why that car sold the way it did. It was big, huge, and fucking fast. And it said SRT on it. None of this bullshit. You didn't have to write supercharged on the side of it. It just said SRT on it. Somebody go on their phone. They're in traffic. What does SRT mean? Uh-oh, it means street racing technology. Oh, shit. I can't race that dude because his car's faster than mine. He's got a fucking muscle car over there. Now, look. What did they do? They took that away. Took it away. Gave it to Dubai. Gave it to Australia. Fucked you over. How about that? No 8-speed for you. You got this old-ass 5-speed that struggles to get up to 170 miles an hour. How about that? How about them apples, huh? <sighs> oh, and by the way, let me not forget, we're going to put Hellcats. We're going to make 707 horsepower cars, and we're not giving that engine to you. Does it fit in your car? Oh, yeah, it fits. But we're not giving you that engine because you ain't nobody. We're not giving it. We're going to give it to Dodge. We're not giving it to you. And we'll, we'll give it to Jeep. And we'll give it to Ram. And we'll, give, we'll make a Ram truck with 707 horsepower. As for your Chrysler, nah, nah, nah. We're not giving you that. Nah, nah, fuck you. Nah, you ain't getting that. Nope. See, you, do you see where I'm going with this? So what led to the car's demise? Why did Chrysler pull the plug on the 300 as a performance car, but then give us the obscene Jeep Trackhawk? 
And finally, where have all the 300 SRT8s gone? So it says demand was drying up. The Chrysler 300 was initially quite a popular car. It offered a relatively good balance of affordability affordability to luxury bar some poor quality interior materials like the like the like the the carbon fiber and the plastic panels and shit it was available with your choice of v6 or v8 engines it made quite a splash in pop culture too appearing in a bunch of music videos and breaking bad well okay the newer one appeared in breaking bad not the older one and were trendy for a time in the world of celebrity. Although that's hardly a signifier of this being a good car, because after all, the Prius wouldn't be the Prius without Hollywood either. Most 300s haven't aged well, mainly due to rapid depreciation or lax maintenance on the part of second and third hand owners. And as a result, the image of the 300 started to diminish. Its poor build quality began to show itself in more places than just the interiors, and a lot of owners just gave up and moved on. The original 300 is like a cheap watch, particularly one that's designed to mimic the look of something more premium. Sure, it serves the same function, but the band feels flimsy and the materials are nowhere near like the real thing. It will age poorly, and it won't take long for people to know you're making a big bluff about the girth of your wallet. I will say this, and it's funny that they have a picture of this silver 300. I always wanted this car in this silver, this bright silver metallic, I believe that's what they called it. I couldn't find it in bright silver metallic, so I ended up getting the darker magnesium silver. I think they called it magnesium gray. I still love the car. The only downside was if you get any scratches, it's easier to see them. The silver hides the scratches really well. This silver with these 20-inch wheels was really the best spec that you could buy this car in, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I always liked the way this car right here looked. I really did. Um, I've seen, I, as you know, in my one of my videos not long ago, I saw a, a woman driving one of these cars, and she had the silver spec just like this, and she kept her car. The mere fact that she still got that car after all this time means she must be taking care of it. Um... I always liked this car, I always wanted this car, but I ended up getting the same car, but it had the dark silver metallic, so, you know. Uh, but I, I think it looks good, and I also think it aged well. The only downside is the interior was shit. I mean, if you had all of the possible features, the interior was bearable, but once the 2011s, once those came out, and they had all the newer technology, and then the 2012 came out, the 2012... Well, I mean, you've got heated and cooled seats. You've got adaptive cruise control. You've got a new navigation system with a better-looking screen that's nearer to the sight line of the driver. You've got a panoramic moonroof. I mean, once that newer 300 came out, it was all over for this one. And that's that's understandable. That's understandable. You know, it's, op, it's planned obsolescence. That's what the industry calls it. It says, how can a car pretend to be prestigious and high-end when so many became decrepit in a relatively short amount of time? And more importantly, does the first Gen 300 have a saving grace? The answer, if your Chrysler is to replace the meandering V6s and Economy Plus 5.7 liter V8s with the stonking, hot-cammed 6.1 Hemi V8 producing 425 and capable of 0 60 under 5 seconds. This was pre-Hellcat Chrysler. But even so, it seemed the solutions to the 300's fake Rolex image was a huge dosage of horsepower. Reviewers loved it. Though no amount of horsepower V8 noise could distract from the dismal interior plastic. So again, the interior was shit. The exterior looked great. The interior wasn't that great. There were some visual tweaks that give the car an aggressive and purposeful stance. In fact, from when, when this car first came out, the wheels were staggered. The rear wheels were one size, the front wheels were smaller. So you couldn't... Swap. You couldn't uh, do wheel rotations. You you had to basically just replace tires, and you were gonna go through tires like every five to six thousand miles. You were gonna go through some rear tires. 
Bigger brakes and a lower and stiffer suspension to help offset the car's 4,200-pound curb weight. It was good for 173 miles per hour, which on a long enough stretch of tarmac could put it ahead of its more expensive German rivals that were all limited to 155. Now, what some people say is, oh, yeah, well, you could take the speed governors off. Okay, but for the most part, this car had enough power where most of those other rivals would not have been able to touch it at that time. All of this could have been yours in 2006 for $43,000. Back then, that's not an insane amount of money, but more importantly, it, along with the spicy SRT8 versions of the Charger and Challenger, let us not forget the Magnum Muscle Wagon, previewed the madness that Chrysler was about to unleash. Hellcat engines for everyone, except the 300. How about that? The unveiling of the Dodge Hellcat 6.2 liter supercharged. See, this is a mistake that they keep making. They put the Dodge Hellcat 6.4 liter supercharged. Now, the engine of the Hellcats is mostly the same, except the stroke is shorter. So instead of 6.4 liter, it's Dodge Hellcat 6.2. When I tell you that most of these journalists don't do enough spell checking and checking of their facts, that's what I'm talking about. It says supercharged V8 in 2015, and it's subsequent rollout to basically every rear-wheel drive Chrysler product was a pivotal moment in the modern muscle car wars. The fact that a normal person could and still can buy a brand new performance car from Dodge with 707 horsepower, rear-wheel drive, and if you only need the two-door Challenger, a manual gearbox. Now, I'm going to stop right there. The manual for the Hellcat was a huge mistake. Now, some people will love to argue with me. I don't care what you have to say. It was a huge mistake. Those Dodge Challengers that were driven regularly were tearing their gears apart. The first, second, and third gear of those Hellcats was getting destroyed by the Hellcat engines. It put out way too much torque for those manuals. So what did Chrysler do? Chrysler said, you know what? Since these cars are spending all this time in the shop and they're fucking us over for warranty money, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that all of them have automatic eight speeds. Now, there were some people upset about that. Some people bit their tongue and just took it. But the reality was, and I'm going to say it again, and I know somebody's going to have a problem with it. I don't care. The Challenger should have never had that six-speed manual. They just shouldn't have done it. Manuals are okay for these slow-ass, boring cars that are being still pumped out by Japan. Yeah, the manual is great for that. But not for something like this. These cars go through that gear set so quickly. Because you got to understand, first, second, and third gear, those things, by the time... If you're at the light and you're driving and there's a bunch of these Japanese cars, these little front-wheel drive pieces of shit with these CVTs and these stu- even the traditional V6s with the regular trans- uh, transmissions, if you're next to them in traffic, if you're next to a Maxima and Ultima, if you're next to a, a what is it, a, a, what is it, a, a Volkswagen, if you're next to most of those cars, by the time those cars get to third gear, you're already at like fifth or sixth. If you're driving a Hellcat, you take right off from that fucking line. There's a little bit of wheel spin, which is why it's unfortunate these things never got all-wheel drive. But those things take right off, and they go straight up that gear list. Once they get to gear 8, they tend to stay right in gear 8 because they're maximizing their fuel economy. But if you're in gear 8, you must be doing highway speed. Now, if you put that car in economy, or even the Jeep SRT, if you put it in economy, what it does is it goes from first gear, it switches automatically to second gear, it stays in second gear, and then it works its way quickly up to eighth gear. The point is, those cars quickly rip through those first three gears. First three gears get ripped through, goes to eight as quickly as possible. Those cars were stripping those Tremec six-speed transmissions, stripping them, just stripping them. First, second, third gear, fucked up. The other problem was if it wasn't stripping those gears, if you know how to drive a manual, you know what I'm talking about. It was causing the gears to stick. So either you were stripping the gears or you were causing the gears to stick. I guess the service centers got tired of it. 
They replaced them when they had to replace them. But they said, no, the red eye is going to be 797 horsepower. So, no, we're going to make this automatic. The Demon is going to have a wicked launch control. We're going to make this automatic. All of the new cars, automatic, period. And it made sense when you really think about it, because look at the competition. Look at even the supercars, the hypercars. Everything's pretty much automatic. A Bugatti Chiron, automatic. You push two buttons, the fucking car does 270 miles an hour for the transmission. You push, all you got to do is push one button, put that thing in park. You put one button, put that shit in drive. Shit goes straight to fucking 270 when you're in drive. Look at the Lamborghinis. The Lamborghinis, they were like, nah, these transmissions, man, and we can't do that shit. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an automatic manual shift. So we're going to put the stalks, and you you, you click this, the, your right hand, you click it, and that shit will go uh, drive or whatever. If you push both at the same time, it'll go to neutral. They knew goddamn well that they were not going to keep making... Uh, what are those manual transmissions after the amount of work that they had to put into those Murcielagos and those Reventons? Because the Reventon was the last car they made before they pulled out the Aventador. The Aventadors, all of them are automatic. They know that these engines are so powerful that they will fuck those transmissions up. They just know it. Anybody who got one of these cars, those things stay in the shop. Especially if they have a manual. Stay in the shop. Find me somebody who's got a manual transmission. Show me how much mileage they have. And then show me how many times their car has been in the shop. And show me the repair bill. I have an email. You can send it to me. You can black out all the other information. And you tell me I'm lying. Every single time. Shit, when I make videos in Chrysler. Different Chrysler service centers. Fuck it. What's on that? What's on that lift? Manual Charger. I'm sorry. Manual Challenger Hellcat. And that's why they knew. They said when the charger comes out, we're not doing this in manual. We're just not doing it. So they stopped those manuals because they knew that that car could. It just it just wasn't. It couldn't do it. So they said, listen, we'll put the, these crate engines out. If you want a manual, build it yourself. Because otherwise, you're going to cost us thousands of dollars in that uh, in that warranty. So they were like, no, nah, we're not, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. Okay, so it says, but sadly, they came at the expense of any form of high-performance Chrysler 300. Though the car is built on the same platform as the Challenger and Chargers in the same Southern Ontario factory. That's right, the Hellcat is made in Canada. And it uses the same power plants in the lower trims. The 300 missed out on the Hellcat treatment. Uh, let me just say something. Uh, the car is built in Canada. As far as I know... Hellcat superchargers were being built in Mexico. Unless they changed something, the engines were being built in Mexico and they were shipped up to Canada for final assembly. They may have changed something, so don't quote me on that, but from what I remember, those parts were made in Mexico. The car was refreshed from its troubled first generation in 2011, adopting a much more mature and respectable design, along with some very welcome improvements to the design and quality of the interior materials. I disagree. The mere fact that they were still using those fucking carbon fiber stickers... I have to disagree. It still never felt truly as high-end as the established luxury players. But once again, it had value on its side, starting significantly cheaper. Yeah, for what you'd pay from Audi or Mercedes or BMW to get what you have in one of those Chrysler 300s from 2012 to 2014, you would have to spend $100,000 because the only ones of their cars you'd be able to get is the AMG, the M5, or possibly the Audi S8, or the S, whatever, 6, 5, 6, 7, whatever. I don't really care about Audi. I don't pay them any attention. All right. There are still a fast version. There was still a fast version, though it dropped the 8. So it started becoming SRT. Now, I actually liked that. I was a little disappointed it didn't say SRT8. But what I really thought about it, I was like, yeah, SRT, that's pretty cool. That makes sense. The new 300 SRT had a bigger, more powerful V8, 6.4 liters, 470 horsepower, as well as many of the same chassis tweaks as the SRT8, including bigger Brembo brakes, stiffer suspension. Perhaps the biggest improvement was the move away from the sluggish 5-speed automatic to the new Torque Flight 8. Here's the problem, though. America never got the 8 in the 300 SRT. We didn't get the 8-speed. I know the 2012s didn't have it. Now, as far as I know, the 2014s didn't get it either. 
when they moved those cars to Dubai and Australia, those cars got the eight-speed. And what they did was instead of giving us the mock shift stick, the 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 mock stick shifter that was in my 2012, what they did was they changed it to a dial, if you remember. So you never got the proper treatment. Instead of just giving us the fucking parts from Dodge, instead of putting, even, listen, nobody would have complained if they took that Dodge shifter and they put the Dodge Charger shifter in the 300. Nobody would have complained. what they do? They give us a fucking dial. A fucking dial. As if I'm driving a Pacifica. This massively improved shift times and efficiency. And so far, the 8 HP has proven itself to be a reliable unit. It's in pretty much all the Hellcats. But sadly, it wasn't enough. When newly formed Fiat Chrysler Automobiles launched a Hellcat engine in 2015, the 300 didn't make the cut. Part of this can be blamed on brand restructuring. After all, Chrysler's image is effortless, luxury and style. Yeah, okay. With an interior that cheap? Yeah, okay. Not organ shifting performance. That's where you fucked up. People were buying that 300 SRT. They were buying it. You didn't give it. What did they say? Give the people what they want and they'll come. You didn't do it. it. It would serve a customer that doesn't exist. Why would the 300 need a 707 horse? Wait, wait, wait. Do you understand how stupid you fucking sound? If you're in a boardroom and they're like, okay, guess what? New products. We got this 707 horsepower Dodge Challenger. We got a 707 horsepower Dodge Charger. So you raise your hand, you stupid motherfucker. I don't know who you are. I hope you get fired forever. Oh, well, excuse me. Uh, the Chrysler buyer, I mean, why would they need 707 horsepower? I mean, they don't need that, right? Let me tell you something. You know that meme where they take the guy and they throw him out the window? You're lucky I'm not the CEO. You're lucky because I would have sent you home for the day. Either through that window or through the front door, but one way or another, you're going home that day just for saying something that fucking stupid idiot. That said, I cannot imagine a scenario when I would ever need 700... Are you fucking kidding? You hear this shit? You hear this? I can't imagine a scenario. What if a Nissan GTR pulls up next to me? What if any BMW pulls up next to me? What if any Mercedes pulls up next to me? In fact... I don't need 707 horsepower. I need 1,007 horsepower. I need the fucking elephant in this car. Just so when they're staring at taillights and they want it the next time they go to their barbershop and they want to brag about how fast their little fucking BMW and their Mercedes is, the only thing that they can think about is, yeah, my car is really fast, except for that Hellafin 300 that blew my fucking doors off. I don't need 707. I need 1,007. But you, whoever was there, said, hey, listen. Hey, guys. Yeah, listen, guys. Listen, everybody. I don't really think that somebody who buys a luxury car like the uh, 300 really needs. I mean, they don't really need 707 horsepower, right? In fact, you know what? I had a second thought. The people who are buying Jeep Grand Cherokee, we're going to, instead of calling it a Hellcat, what we're going to do, everybody, what we're, uh, listen to this, listen to this. What we're going to do is we're going to call it the Track Hawk, right? Because birds go around tracks, right? So we're going to call it the Track Hawk. We don't want to call it Hellcat. We're going to call it the Track Hawk. And you know what we're going to do? Since all of the Hellcats have Hellcat hoods, I'm starting to think that the Hellcat hood is played out. So what we're going to do is we're going to give it the same hood as the regular one, right? Right? Let me tell you something. If I was that CEO, that would have been your last fucking day at work. And I mean that. I mean it. That would have been your last fucking day at work. And if you hadn't achieved your pension yet, well, you're just going to have to go home and go on OnlyFans and start stripping for money because that would have been your last day. If I was the CEO, that would have been your last fucking day at work. That would have been it. You'd have been fired. Period. Your last day at work. 
You understand me? Somewhere out there, you're listening to this. Maybe you still work for the company. Maybe you don't. But if I was that CEO, that would have been your last fucking day at work. That would have been your last day for you to raise your hand and say some stupid shit like that. That would have been your last day at work. That right there, just by raising your hand and trying to participate, that would have been your last fucking day at work. You'd have been fired. Just like that. Fired. Anyway. Yet, the Hellcat-powered Jeep Trackhawk exists, and Ram will soon employ the engine service in the TRX. Well, this has already happened, but you have to remember this article is from 2020. The Ram TRX has 707 horsepower because it's got the Hellcat supercharger atop the Hemi engine. By that logic, there absolutely should be a 300 Hellcat, right? But it's never going to happen, at least not by the manufacturers. The DIYers who do it yourself and hot rodders might have a chance to accomplish it, but not from the factory. So let's just understand this. The 300 SRT, had I been Chrysler CEO, you'd have had... Let me, let me tell you this. This would have been my lineup. This would have been my lineup. I'm the CEO right now. This would have been my lineup. You got the Dodge... Magnum Hellcat. The Dodge Magnum Hemi 5.7 all-wheel drive. The Dodge Magnum 3.6 Pentastar V6 in either all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive. Next, Dodge Charger and Challenger Hellcat. Dodge Charger and Challenger available with all-wheel drive, Hemi V8, Pentastar V6 optional. Next, Chrysler 300 Hellcat. Chrysler 300, Pentastar V6, Chrysler 300 all-wheel drive, Hemi C. Next, Ram. Hellcat! How, okay, however, however, you'd have the Ram Hellcat, 707 horsepower. But we'd have a red-eye version with 840 horsepower called the Ram T-Rex. Eight fucking 40. Or, 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 no, or, no, okay, yes, yes, 840, 840, yes, 840, 840 in the Challenger and the Charger. You get 840, and the Ram would be the T-Rex with all the Tyrannosaurus stuff, and the version of that engine in the Challenger and Charger, those would have been the Red Eyes. So instead of you getting 797, you'd have had 8 fucking 40. How about the Dodge Demon? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you think I'm going to release a Dodge Demon with 840? Fuck that. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We've got a new aluminum engine that weighs less than the other Hemi. And this thing's got a thousand fucking horsepower. We got the Dodge Demon. A thousand fucking horsepower, Dodge Demon. Aluminum engine. Less weight than the other cars that we've already put out. Less mass. This motherfucker does wheelies. Real wheelies. Whether you got skinny ties or the regular size rims. This thing does fucking wheelies. So you've got to sign this bigger waiver. Like it came with a waiver. You had to sign it and say, listen, I promise I won't use these tires on the regular street. No, 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 no. You're going to have to sign this other waiver that says that this goddamn thing, every time you put your fucking foot down, this bastard does fucking, it does a pops a fucking wheelie and it does zero to 60 in less than fucking nine seconds. In fact, no, no, no. It does zero to 60 in less than eight. So, while you're busy recommending me for the presidency because I've done such a good job, that, that's, where, that's where I would have taken you. That's, where, that's what I would have put out. 
Anyway, where are we now? Where are they now? Here we go. Where are they now? Unfortunately, SRT badge 300s are scarce nowadays, and most of them have held on to a surprising amount of their value. Hey, you want to know why they held on to their value? It's because while the Germans were busy downsizing their V8s and putting fucking hair dryers next to their V8s, twin turbo hair dryers, the 300 SRT still remains one of the largest naturally aspirated large displacement V8s on the market that's not in a truck. So these V8 engines that you got from the Germans, you see how quickly Lamborghini said, oh, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to have a V12. We're going to go down. We're going to make the yours. It's going to have a V8 with twin turbo hair drive. Hey, guess what's faster than that, yours? These motherfucking Hemi-powered Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat. Why? Because instead of less than 700 horsepower, we got more than 700 horsepower. Do you see how this shit works? Oh. Well, we over here at Bugatti. Oh, yeah. Well, these W16 engines with these four... Turbo charges, yeah, that, that, that's not working out too well because the repairs are so expensive. So what we're going to do is we're going to downsize that. We're going to downsize that. We're probably going to go electric. We're going to downsize all that. See how this works? When you build something nobody else builds and you do it right, a oh, surprising amount of their value, of course they did. Because this is the last car you can... Cadillac dropped their V8s. They kept around this new black wing. But the black wing is another twin turbo hair dryer. Look at Navigator. Look at Lincoln Navigator. Lincoln Navigator's got a V6 engine with twin turbo hair dryers in it. Twin turbo hair dryers. Two hair dryers to make twin turbo. I give up. I give up. Cadillac with the new Escalade. Said, you know what? We're going to put twin turbos on our V8 and we're going to make this car, this Escalade, we're going to make this as fast as it should have been in the first fucking place. But what Cadillac didn't do was Cadillac didn't say, hey, you know what? We got this uh, CTSV and this thing has the LSA engine and it makes 550 horsepower. I got an idea. How about. We put a supercharged engine in this Escalade so that we could justify the fact this thing costs $120,000. Right? Right? Um, as far as me talking about the uh, Escalade, I'd have to actually go back and check to see. Oh, no, you know what? I don't want to let that linger because, yes, I made a mistake. As far as I remember now, yes, the Lincoln Navigator has the smaller displacement V6 engine with the twin turbo hair dryers. The Blackwing Cadillac engine is twin turbos on a V8. The Escalade is supercharged. The problem is it doesn't make anywhere near as much power as the Trackhawk does. So let me just clarify that because I know somebody's going to try to tag me later. Oh, you're wrong. The Escalade, because you, you got to understand, in my mind, I don't write this shit down. I'm balancing a lot of information right now in my mind. So, yes, let me just make that little correction right there. The future is basically all electric, so you're going to have nothing but battery packs and fucking uh, electric motors in any anyway. So, at this point, it almost doesn't matter. So, yes, the Blackwing was a twin-turbo V8. The Cadillac Escalade is a supercharged V8, but it doesn't make as much power as the Durango Hellcat or as much as the Jeep Trackhawk. So, let me just clarify that once again. Unfortunately, the SRT 300s are scarce nowadays, and most of them have held on to a surprising amount of their value considering the shortcomings of the platform. There are less than 10 listed on Auto Trader across Canada. Across Canada. Now, Canada has fewer than 40 million people. Canada has a smaller population than California. These people have all of the wilderness there is, and there's fewer than 10. $15,000 to $20,000 is how much they demand. There are some cheaper than that, but nothing below $10,000. Chrysler discontinued the 300 SRT8, the SRT8, largely because it was becoming an unpopular redundancy. Bullshit. Y'all didn't do enough for it. You didn't advertise it. 
In fact, come to think about it, they never advertised that car. They never advertised it. They advertised Hellcats on Brotherhood of Muscle with Vin Diesel. Why the fuck wasn't the SRT 300 a car in Fast and Furious? They put it in Breaking Bad, yay, but they didn't advertise it. They just advertised Dodge. What the fuck are y'all doing over there? Despite the refresh in 2011, sales for the 300 were slowing across the board, and particularly for the high-performance version. And with relatively stronger popularity of the Dodge Charger as a performance car. Well, guess what, guys? If you're going to make the Dodge Charger and you're going to make that get the Hellcat and not put in the 300, well, what the fuck do you expect? If you water something down, if you don't give the Magnum everything it needs to compete in the future, then of course you're going to fucking make sales go down. Nobody's going to look for it. If you don't advertise shit, nobody's going to look for it. What do you think? Anyway, people who wanted serious performance from an FCA vehicle gravitated to... Is, look, think, oh my God. People who wanted serious performance from an FCA vehicle gravitated towards Dodge Charger and Challenger. You know why? Because you didn't give the serious performance to Chrysler 300. You didn't give any serious performance to even the Magnum. And that was a Dodge car. Huh? Instead, you want to put out the stinger. That's what you want to do. You want to put out fucking stinger. Oh, well, yeah, 14,000 orders came in. You know why? Because right now they can't buy anything else. Fucking market's fucked up. Anyway, both of which have far more aggressive designs and more performance-oriented setups and focus. No, they don't. It's the same shit in a different wrapper. While Chrysler buyers were seeking more cal calmness and luxury. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, my God. In their cars. You, you know what's funny? This same shit is the reason why your Jeep Trackhawks, if you have one, because just about, and if you hear the sound of my voice, I know a lot of you are very upset about me saying this. Most of y'all who went out and bought them Jeep Trackhawks and got ripped off, y'all don't even have those cars no more. You know who I'm talking to. Y'all don't even have those cars no more. It's been, what, less than three years. Y'all don't even have those cars no more. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite YouTubers, C.W. Lemoyne, F-18 pilot, F-16 pilot. He had a Dodge Hellcat Durango. I posted it in the community chat. You could look at his uh, last video. C.W. Lemoyne, L-E-M-O-I-N-E. -E, one of my favorite YouTubers. He had that Dodge Hellcat Durango. He had that car for less than two years. He had some of the same problems I had. He had a, a radiator that fucked up on him. And they had his car off. He couldn't use that car for, he said, like two months. Two months. Here I am. My Jeep SRT, because of the PCM, and I'm still waiting for them to get this PCM, they've had my car since fucking August 1st. Y'all keep asking me when I'm going to put out another Apocalypse Drive video. I'm not doing it until I get my fucking Jeep back. They've had my car since August fucking 1st. I'm daily driving a Hyundai Sonata. I'll get to that in a minute. FCA's performance cars try to be uncompromised in their pursuit of huge power and performance, often eschewing the extra weight from luxury materials and sound deadening. And those are the only real differentiators for the Chrysler 300 over its relatives. A slower, heavier, and softer charger, SRT slash Hellcat, that wouldn't be able to define its place in the lineup. Thus, the high-performance 300 is dead. Okay, so I finally got through this. I probably have been rambling and raving for the last hour. I've probably been doing this for an hour. Right now it is 6 o'clock. Therefore, right now, Chrysler is unveiling the changes for the 300. The final 300 is being unveiled right now because it's 6 o'clock. So right now, I'm going to stop this portion of the video and I'm going to add in the part where I'm talking about the unveiling of the 300. Basically, it's a final call, but they're not going to call it final call because they're calling that for the Dodge cars. So that's what I'm going to put on to this right now. So this is it. They're introducing the damn thing. They got, it. They got this little video going for it. 
and it's exactly what I expected. I posted a picture of my community chat already a couple of hours ago, and uh, basically, okay, so you see the panoramic moonroof. You see, it's got the uh, tail lights. Uh, it's got it's got like slightly new design tail lights. It's got new wheels, and uh, within those new wheels, that's it. <laughs> 300C, red, white, and blue. There you go. So now they're taking photos of it. I'm not going to do this too long because I'm only going to use this without copyright. So, fair use. 6.4 liter heavy. Now I know our 485 horsepower. That's it. That's it. So let me build this. So basically, basically, that's it. That That's all they got to show. So guess what? All of the people were like, oh, yeah, well, what about the Hellcat? Oh, you ain't getting no goddamn Hellcat. I told you. That's it. That is it. Fair use. That is it. That's it. It's dead. Yeah, I mean, granted, listen, this model is going to sell because this is probably the last version of this car before they go all electric. But that's it, guys. That's it. I can't fucking believe this. But these bastards, you know what they did? Standard. I'm looking at heated and ventilated uh, seats. I'm looking at this right now. So they got the heated and ventilated seats. But what I'm looking at is again, all you get is that knob. The power, the knob controls the transmission. So that's all you're getting. Transmission knob. From what it, from what I can tell, it doesn't look like you get heated and cooled cup holders. From what I can tell, and I don't even think that's an option anymore. So. If you look at the videos that I made you of my 300 SRT when I bought it, you can see the way this car was supposed to come. Some people that was saying this thing was going to be $100,000, but even I knew that wasn't going to happen. I had this exact same car in black, and my car was $58,000. So they're already telling you that the price is under $58,000. When I when I get on the Chrysler configurator in a minute, I'm going to show you what it looks like configured. But I knew this car was... Now, here's the thing. Some people might try to do markups or something. Yeah, that's always a possibility. But I knew damn well this car wasn't going to be in the $100,000 range. And there was people saying that. And I was like, guys, you don't even understand how much this car cost in the first place. This car was less than $60,000. There's no way it's going to $100,000. It doesn't even have a Hellcat. I hate to shit on them this hard. But, I mean, listen. If you've got the eyes of the entire world on you and you don't say or do something spectacular, it's like... Oh, man. You know, it's really sad because as much as I love this fucking car, you got to remember, I had three of these cars. I had the 2.7 2006. I had the SRT8 2006. And then I had the 2012 SRT. And, they, and then they pull this bullshit. And this is it. Now, if they'd come out there and they say, yeah, well, we got this lip. Now, they're, they're calling it the limited edition 300C. So as you can see, they completely dropped SRT off as I already understood that they had and that they were going to continue to do. And then there's no Hellcat. So already you already know how people are going to respond to this. There are some people out there who will buy this car because it's a limited edition model. But for the most part it's 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 really it's it's i mean listen for people who normally would go out there and buy a scat pack it's okay because this is higher end as you can see this has the adaptive cruise control and it has uh the front bumper sensors so if you bought this you would actually be paying about six or seven thousand dollars more uh, well, then again, the Dodge Charger and Challengers is so hard to get into stock that chances are if you actually bought this, you might actually pay less than you'd pay if you bought a fully loaded scat pack. Um, and the scat packs are shit because they don't even give you the fucking SRT steering wheel. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of my car just to remember, just to help you remind you. Now, in fact, I'm going to put one of my old videos on here just to remind you of what I had. Because a lot of people forgot what this car was all about when it came out. So the bottom line is, let's just take a look right here. Explore, Reserve. I, I don't know if you can build it, but let's just look at the Explore. I don't think they've made it so you can actually... Uh, they say you have to have a reservation. And they're saying Reserve the 300C. Um, so I'm guessing that they're going to fully equip these things. You've got these 
three options bright right xperia gloss black and you get red so you got white black red which is odd because the emblem that they have is red white and blue so you think that they even have a blue one they never put a blue one out but anyway featured highlights 6.4 liter hemi red four piston brembo brakes tricolor 300c badge 20 by 9 forged wheels black laguna seats i had all of that except for the badge I had all of that except for the bat. I didn't have red brakes. My brakes, if I'm not mistaken, were either silver. They were silver, from what I remember. And this is it. This is it. $55,000. Call now. Really? Really? That's it? That, so you got, you got everybody's appetites wet, and this is what you did. Let's go back to the explore part. Let's go back to where it says explore. You could you could go on there and do this yourself. But let's go let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the explore part. Performance design. Oh my god, this is sad. It's like watching, you know, I I feel more sad watching this car die than watching some people I know die. Like it, it's a shame of what this could have been and what it's never going to be. So here's a couple of photos from the inside. What is this? Does that, um, uh, the, the wheels, these wheels look boring. I liked, I liked the first generation 300 SRT8 wheels better. Ugh, Jesus Christ. I, well, as I told you guys, I'm done. I already said it. I'm done. I, I knew they weren't going to do anything spectacular. And I'm done. I'm, I moved on. I'm done. I am done. I'm absolutely done. I knew that people kept on asking me, oh, if they make a Hellcat, would you buy it? I was like, fuck no. I'm moving on to Cadillac. I'm getting me a Cadillac Lyric. I'm done. I already had this. The only thing that this car has that I didn't have was the 8-speed. I already had this. I'm done. I am done. I'm done. That's all. So let's see. It says, okay, so I guess that's pretty much it. I was looking for a photo of that stupid knob shifter inside, but I don't think they put a photo of it because it, they 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 quickly changed the, uh, what is it called? They changed the uh, layout of the uh, uh, website, the webpage. So they took away, they only have the reserve button, but they, they, took, they took away the explore button. But that's it. So basically, everything that I liked about having my car, all they've done is they took the 300 SRT and they basically made it a 300C. And that's all they did. So if you bought this car, you could snatch these stupid badges off if you really wanted to. And you could put the SRTA badges on, the SRT badges on yourself. Now, there are some of you who are going to you know, try to do what some of these YouTubers have done and you're going to try to squeeze a Hellcat into one of these things, let me tell you something. There's a reason why you don't see them racing those cars. It's because that entire drive shade, that the entire drivetrain will tear itself apart. The Hellcats not only have the Hellcat engine, but they also have the 8-speed transmission. But on top of that, they also have special drive shafts they have half shafts that are more powerful and able to take more force so unless you buy a charger hellcat and take all of the parts out of that and put it into one of these 300s you can't build a worthwhile version of it and then you're going to have heating problems one of the things about my 300 that i remember that car always ran hot like yeah it used premium fuel and you could feel that heat in that car. You could feel the heat coming through that transmission tunnel. This car, if you try to take that, and I and I know some people, what they did was they got the Hellcat hood fabricated because they needed more airflow. Let me tell you something. By the time you deal with this shit, trying to do that retrofit, you're going to have spent a hundred thousand. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So as far, now, now to be positive, if you were a person who wanted a 300, and you wanted the best version of the real wheel drive 300 you could get, this is the car for you. However, if you wanted a 300 and you're the type of person who obeys speed limits, the best version you could get is a fully loaded Hemi 
C version all wheel drive instead of rear wheel drive. And it depends where you live because some people live in dry climates. I live in New York. And as you know, the climate up here is not conducive to rear wheel drive cars that much between the months of like November and freaking uh, April. It's like you have to be ready for flash flooding and you also have to be ready for flash snow. So, you know, depending upon where you live, I mean, some people are going to buy this car. They'll be happy with it. They're charging you $55,000. My car had more features in looks and was 58. I had better wheels than this car had. I'm going to show you. That's, what I'm, that's, the last, that's how I'm going to end this video. I'm going to show you the video that I made, a repost of when I first got my 2012. Let me tell you something, and I might as well make this video about the differences between my car and the old uh, SRT8. So if you've got, let me tell you something, if you've got a new SRT8, you've probably been looking at the, um, I mean, if you have an old SRT8, you've probably been looking at the new ones and wondering, you know, whether or not you should trade up. But let me tell you something, this car right here had far better seats than the new 392s. Now, you take a look at the headroom when these seats are sitting straight up. You take a look at this headroom. These seats, you sit in the seat. Like, you see these bolsters? The, the bolsters in this car were so deep that when you sit in these seats, you really, really sit in these seats. And notice the distance between the seat and the floor. Because one thing I've noticed about my car, and I believe it's due to this roof line. The new roof line is so much lower that when you're sitting, even when you have this seat at the highest position, right right now it's, it's almost at the exact highest position it can be. When you're sitting in this car, you can sit very upright if you're a tall guy. But in the new 392s, because the roof line is so much, the, the rake of the roof line is so much more dramatic, and they did that so that it gets better wind resistance, it, it, it has a lower drag coefficient, but the roof line of the new cars makes it look longer and it makes it harder to sit straight up right. It, it makes it a little harder to sit up right. Now, uh, I've, some people have been telling me, like, yeah, my car looks great, but they think my car is smaller. They think my 392 is smaller than this car. But ru they're roughly the same size, and I think that the new ones are slightly wider, but, and I think they're also slightly longer. But um, everybody who's seen me in that car, they think that um, my they think that this new car looks smaller than this other car, and I keep trying to tell them it's because of the roof. But uh, yeah, it's basically the, let me tell you something. If I could take these fucking seats out of this car and drop it in this new 392, believe me, I'd have done it already. Now I, I don't even know if they'd fit in this new car. And the other downside is that these old seats don't have the the uh, ventilation function in the lower back but let me tell you something this car has the best seats I've used with the exception of my old s550 the s550 has the absolute best seats on earth I've you I've driven every other car the Porsche Panamera I've, I've driven a couple of Bentleys and this that and other that fucking s550 had the absolute best seats ever Best, best seats ever, but this car right here is number two. When it comes to having sports seats, I can't think of a car that has better sports seats than this. And another thing, with the new car, I'm a little disappointed that it says SRT, but it doesn't say the 8 in the new car. These seats, Chrysler really thought of everything when they made this car. When they made this car right here, they thought of everything. Everything that they could possibly do for 2000, uh, what was it, 2004, 2005, that time frame. Back then, this car, I mean, this car had everything. The Lincoln MKS doesn't have the tilt-down automatic mirrors. And uh, most cars, like, for instance, that Lincoln MKS, that Lincoln MKS that my uncle got, his does not have uh, the fold-down seats right here. My new car has them. This old car has them. And it's really funny that it's amazing how much stuff this car actually had. You know? But um, right now, it's being sold. Right now, it's got a stock number. Uh, I think that says, um, I think it says U151906 Chrysler 300-330132. Must be the last couple of digits of the VIN number. 
but um, this freaking car right here, I don't know who's gonna buy this car, but you know, I, I had fucked up and put these brand new tires on. <laughs> I wish I could have keep these tires, but I put brand new Eagle GTs on this car, so whoever ends up buying this car has brand new tires, brand new brakes, and uh, they got the supercharger in it. So, um, you know, and they, they have this really cool grill. A lot of people who've seen my videos ask me, you know, where they can get a grill like this. Because this is a really good look for this car. So probably, I think whoever buys it will probably just repaint it. Look at the front of that fucking thing. Look at that thing. That thing's beautiful. That thing's beautiful. Look at the front of that. But they'll, they'll probably have to repaint it because... You know, I had replaced the bumper, and I was thinking about painting this car a different color, but then I decided against it. I was like, you know what, there's no point in putting a lot of money into an older car when it was a 2006. Had it been like a 2010, I might have considered it. But um, I was going to repaint the bumper, and uh, I was going to put in some more aggressive uh, shocks or whatever. And I said, fuck it, I'll just get a new car and uh, put the uh, Hemi 440 Stroker in it, you know. But um, whoever buys this car, God bless them. In fact, what I should do is leave a note inside and tell them that th how much money this car made me right here on YouTube from videos. But I'm, I'm just saying, man, Chrysler fucking broke the mold when they made this car. And the only, the only thing that bothers me about my new 392 is the goddamn roof line where you ha it's like you just don't have as much head space. And that's, that's the only thing. Other than that, this car was fantastic absolutely fantastic and I like the way the old wheels look the old rims had so many more spokes that they actually look bigger because some people have asked me are the rims on my new car smaller and I keep telling them no the 20s they're both 20s no matter which SRT you get but for some reason some people think they look smaller and I think it has to do with you know the number of spokes and it's like a it's like a, a optical illusion or something but uh, this was a this was a fucking awesome car right here, you know. What? Yeah, that's what it was. But uh, the technology got old, and it was just time to upgrade. So um, you know, I I think I'm gonna leave a note in it for whoever ends up buying it, because I'd like to stay in contact with them. Now, um, with the new SRT8s, my main complaint is what they did to the roof. Now, I understand that they're trying to get higher uh, uh, fuel efficiency through um, reduced wind resistance, but my argument is that, you know, when you're driving a brick, it because this thing is basically the shape of a brick, it, it's like you're, you're dealing with almost like 5,000 pounds worth of iron. What they really need to do to increase uh, fuel efficiency is they need to get some aluminum block engines and make them as powerful as they do these iron blocks. And um, <coughs> I really think that um, this roof, changing the roof was not a great idea. Because the thing about it is, with this new roof line, what happens is, I well, smaller people won't feel it, because I, I'm like two meters tall. But when you try to sit straight up, what you'll notice is these seats are oddly, these seats are ridiculously flat. And right here, most people's backs are not perfectly shaped like that. So what you end up having is no support right here, and it just falls off into nothing. So when you sit in this seat, you don't really sit in the seat as well as you sit in the other one. Now, while it looks like it has the same amount of headroom as the other, the, the problem is when you sit on these seats, you are not, you don't become one with the seat. That's the old SRT8 had far better seats. And I'll never stop talking about the fact that it doesn't say 8 right here. As far as I'm concerned, if you have SRT4, it should say 4. If you have a 6, it should say 6, like the crossfire. And if you have an 8, it should say 8. I don't appreciate them taking that away. But uh, other than that, it's actually weird how long this door suddenly feels. When you open up this door and you're getting out, it feels like this door is a lot longer. It feels like the car has somehow been stretched like in a Photoshop. But that's really my only, that's only, that's my only complaint. I really don't have any other complaints. So, um, the seats and the roof line. But, um, other than that, fantastic car. I've been having fun with the, uh, SRT8, uh, computer. 
a performance computer. I've been having fun with it. It's a pretty good car. You know, I, a lot of people really, really like the older model more, but uh, this is fun. This is fun. This will hold me for uh, a little while, so long as nothing else comes out that whets my appetite. It's a sick, vicious car right here. And my boy's got the Jeep SLR T8. We're just here at uh, BJ's uh, doing a little bit of shopping. Yeah, so uh, should have just had him park right behind me. But we, yeah, that's how we do it, man. It's SLR T8 everything. That's how it is. SLR T8. Yeah, SLR T8 everything. If it ain't, if it don't say SLR T8, I ain't interested. If you use the remote start, the uh, car is actually pretty smart in the winter. It automatically knows to turn on the uh, driver's heated seat, and it also automatically knows to turn on the heated steering wheel. In addition to that, I also noticed that the car senses whether or not it needs to turn on the uh, front windshield uh, warmer or the rear windshield defogger or de-icer. So uh, that's actually pretty good. I'm glad it knows things like that. And... Um, there are settings inside where you can ask, you can tell it to do things like to turn certain parts on, like you can say rain sensing wipers on automatically, and you, you there's a there's a very deep uh, customization system here. So if you don't want it turning on your heated or ventilated seat, you don't have to have it do so. But um, all in all, UConnect Touch is probably the best touchscreen system on the entire market. And it works equally the same in the Jeep SLT. The one major concern when you're buying a uh, performance rear-wheel drive car is how does it handle when you have inclement weather conditions, when you have snow? Well, basically, um, I never had a problem with the SRT uh, 6.1 liter uh, 300 that I had. Um, and this 6.4 really doesn't give me a problem either. But the main thing that you basically have to do is you have to be diligent in keeping the revs down. Because the problem with this car, even on drive pavement, is that this thing has so much torque that just, you know, stepping on the pedal a little too hard is enough to break the right, the wheels in the back loose. And uh, you don't want to be slipping and sliding all over the ice or the snow. So basically, you just have to keep this car under 30 miles an hour. Now, the Jeep doesn't have that problem, obviously, because it's, you know, um, all wheel drive. But the uh, problem with the Jeep is that it comes on Pirelli tires, and those Pirellis are really not that great in uh, snow and ice. Now, one thing I really like about this car is like, you know, as you get closer to another car, you have front detection, and it also, like, it tells you how close you are to the next vehicle. So front and rear ultrasound is really great. And also, if you're driving too fast, it'll warn you if it feels that you're driving too fast. Um, especially uh, if you bypass the uh, speed limit, which they, they show you the speed limit right here on the Uconnect. And um, it knows exactly what the speed limit is for whatever zone. But um, when you're driving in bad weather, the easiest thing to do is simply to drive in, um, you know, you're basically driving in first gear and you're driving below 30 miles per hour. You know, as, even at 50, the car is stable. The thing about it is I don't like putting the uh, electronic slip protection to the test. I, I'd rather err on the side of caution. Um, you know, so this is uh, the rear view camera and whatever. So you got the rear view, you got the front view. Makes it nice and easy for uh, getting apart, you know? Make sure you're not too close to the next guy. Make sure you're not too far away. Um, the Uconnect uh, system in the uh, Jeep 300 Charger and Challenger has these red lines that indicate where the tail of the car is and for the most part they're very accurate so as long as you stop at the yellow you give the next guy behind you enough space to pull out see so um all in all works uh extraordinarily well and um if you're worried about getting a rear wheel drive car i really wouldn't worry most people will say what you should do is get uh what are they called uh winter tires you could go that route, but ultimately nothing's going to really beat all-wheel drive because of the ability to really dig through snow. It's not just the, the ice that you're driving on. You have the ability with, with all-wheel drive to dig through snow, where in a rear-wheel drive cars get stuck and you end up having to shovel behind them and whatever to get them out. So all-wheel drive cars, they give you a little bit more um, leeway 
if you have like deep snow right around the wheels because um especially with even all season performance tires um you know there's there's no perfect solution but if you have a rear wheel drive car like a mustang or something um i would say uh winter tires like blizzax are a good idea but if you um you know if, if you really really want to buy one of these cars and you're not crazy about you know having a high performance car i would go for the all-wheel drive 300 or the all-wheel drive charger